So my name is Lenka Kleger. I work for a Globe Regional Coordination Office and um, I coordination this phenology campaign that within which uh, this webinar is being organized. Uh, I'm, I'm here with my colleagues Bára Semeráková and uh, Dana Votápková from the Regional Coordination Office who prepared this webinar together uh, with me. So I'm happy that they are here as well. And um, yeah, so welcome to the Trees in the Changing Environment webinar. I'm really happy that uh, you found time to join us today. And uh, this, this webinar, it follows webinar that we organized on April 29th. This, the, the previous webinar was uh, focused on the basics. What is it, phenology? What, what is the seasonal changing of trees and how phenology is related to the carbon cycle? And um, we decided to have one more look on this topic and invite uh, scientists who this time will tell us about their research, their findings and their view on this topic. So I'm really happy to welcome here uh, Zorana Sedlar from um, Natural History Museum from Croatia. Hello, hi, hi. Zorana. Uh, Lenka Hajkova from Czech Hydrometeorological Institute from the Czech Republic. Hi, and uh, Zuzana Hotakova from Charles University, from the Faculty of Science and Department of Experimental Plant Biology. Hi, Zuzka. Everybody, welcome. Okay, and uh, if I can ask Zorana to, to talk, to start uh, okay. with the presentation. Yes, here I go. Um, well, hello, everybody. Uh, my name is Zorana Sedlar. I come from Croatia, uh, as Lenka said. Uh, I am a botanist, uh, an ecologist, and uh, rather recently uh, a phenologist. <laughs> I mean, in my... Um, I will explain through the presentation what I mean. Uh, I hope I will be understandable to everybody. And if there are any questions, you can always uh, ask me. Now I will start to share my screen. Just a second. Uh, okay. Share. I think this is. Do you see the presentation? Yes. Okay. Like this. Okay. Uh, so, I will present you um, a Croatian view of the phenology. I would like to uh, tell you how phenology goes in Croatia uh, in a more scientific point of view. Um, the thing is, uh, phenology is not, uh, wasn't a very popular discipline in biology, so uh, I, I wanted to talk to you about uh, what her advantages are and how the data uh, is used. Uh, so just to tell you, at first, the research history started uh, in 1864, uh, when the first phenology data started to be collected. Uh, but We cannot hear we you. Can't hear. Mostly inside the Croatian uh, uh, in that process, uh, but only it was like secondary data, what I will tell you later. So we had many phenological stations uh, near to meteorolog meteorological stations, uh, which uh, were unfortunately destroyed uh, during our war. and. Uh, uh, we lost many of the data. Some of them are still written in many uh, notebooks because no internet then, uh, but still the valuable data were lost. Um, at that point, many volunteers were included and the phenology was just in service of meteorology and climatology. Uh, it wasn't uh, considered as uh, serious as it is now. Uh, so, the aspects of um, phenology, uh, well, researchers have made great progress, uh, but it has been forgotten as the, as the phenological stations were destroyed. Um, nowadays, actually, many research groups uh, in ecology 
are starting to pay attention to phenology. Uh, botanists, zoologists, but also others. Uh, many new projects now are uh, actually dependent on phenology. How? Because the, you have to know when to go into the field. As, as I am now, uh, to make actually research. That is the first step actually to uh, make phenology uh, be seen as an important part of biology. Uh, the research was mostly inside of forestry, agriculture and pest control. I researched some and uh, our, my colleagues on the Faculty of Forestry have been do doing some uh, research, especially uh, regarding oak and in the region, uh, but also agriculture and agri-meteorology. Uh, those were actually uh, the parts of biology and science that are directly in touch with human needs and he uh, what humans need and how it affects them. So the food production and the forestry. Um, just a second, a bug is trying to come into my car. <laughs> uh, anyway, uh, it is mostly in, in service of these for forestry and agriculture that phenology was looked. Nowadays, uh, climate change is changing everything. Uh, people see uh, what happened in the last 20, 30 years, the changes that have been noticed, observed, and the phenology is really starting to get more important in Croatia. Um, but the results still are used for food production, forest regulation, that's good. But we have to think that we are not the only creatures on this planet, so those data uh, should be used as uh, more of ecological and uh, world savior uh, uh, results. Uh, so all living organism, all organisms actually depend uh, on our research and our results and how we interpret them. And uh, the many, uh, uh, th this is one of those uh, disciplines where you really have to have many data. A really a bunch a bunch of data to make good conclusions uh, because it is dependent on so many factors uh, the, the observations that there is there must be statistically some uh, errors to eliminate them you have to have many data to make good conclusions so this is how uh, the phenology campaign and the globe actually really uh, contribute to new knowledge and I believe that many students uh, start to think about it and really like to contribute uh, to this knowledge because the data is really uh, abundant and uh, it can really be used because uh, it is done on a certain uh, on certain rules and then can be comparable. So during the research in the last more than 100 years uh, in Croatia, many plants have been watched, observed. Uh, some of them are present in the um, phenology campaign, as you can see here, hazel, beech, small leaf lime and uh, oak, uh, cherry, but also uh, dandelion was also observed. Uh, which I don't, I personally don't think is a very indicative species. Uh, they, can you hear me all? It says here that it's unstable, my internet connection, so everything okay? We can hear you well. Yeah, yeah, yeah. okay, okay. <laughs> Just tell me, sign me something if, if something breaks. Uh, a snowdrop also here, you can see, was also observed. That, now that's a good indicator. When does it go up from the ground when it blooms and, and, and similar uh, life cycle um, points. Agricultural crops also. But also what's very interesting is that meadows were also observed and the data also exists for when the meadows were cut for hay. Uh, that's also phenology. So, so many things actually, everything you observe and uh, you put it as data, 
uh, when something blooms or when something fruits or when something uh, bud bursts, anything that happens is phenology if you just, if you just write a date. So uh, whenever you go into nature, you are observing actually phenology. Um, so here are some examples uh, of results that from Croatia uh, that have been observing. Uh, now this table shows the shortening. Where is my mouse? Here it is. Uh, the shortening of uh, ripening period of wine. So this, these are two sorts of wine and you can see how um, the period that uh, the fruit becomes mature for uh, making wine has shortened from 35 days to 22. So definitely a sign of climate change and um, how it uh, concerns uh, product, food production and, uh, and other activities. Uh, here we have the, an example of um, different uh, dates uh, when the fruit of apple, Jonathan leaf, uh, falls or um, uh, it becomes uh, uh, mature. So this actually, uh, we can conclude from here that uh, we can make changes that the apples can be grown maybe higher in the mountains uh, as the climate changes. So we can have uh, conclusions that are uh, positive, but still we have to be um, concerned about the changes. And another one here is from is more than 50 years old from Huar about beginning of uh, flowering for olives. And it also uh, showed the climate change that uh, the temperatures rose. So the flowering began earlier in this period. It's, it's a good indicator again of uh, climate change. And the, uh, the many data that were collected uh, made possible to, so you see the little, uh, the green line, so many data of many years and uh, the approximation of the red line. So uh, we can conclude that it is, it is actually a uh, falling line here on this, uh, on this example. So many data make this line, so we can make nice graphs and actually uh, see the results of our observations. So the data should uh, accept for anthropocentric uh, uh, view, they should be used for ecology, for uh, landscape, for different habitats and for different species. So uh, the phenology data now is used also for uh, studying the biology of species because different species mature at different times. The cycles, the, the eggs, the mature insects, the mating and the nutritional seeds uh, needs, the migrations. Here we have an example of hummingbird migration uh, change from the last century to 10 years ago. Uh, also here leafing dates, uh, just different approaches that concern the complete environment. So uh, nowadays the phenology data are not uh, the secondary data anymore as they were uh, considering meteorological approach, but also uh, it is combined uh, with climatological research uh, on the ecology and uh, together actually they make a good new interdisciplinary uh, conclusions on which new innovative solutions for uh, the problems are made. So 
as climate change has uh, become a major issue in global politics, many programs, many financing programs have been formed to uh, connect these data and to have uh, more and more observers uh, make observations, make data and uh, to be able to conclude uh, good, good to make good results, to have uh, valid conclusions uh, and which we can after use today or in 10 years all the data are very specific and uh, very important. Uh, I, I was also, for example, in a project of uh, vegetation mapping and uh, uh, the permanent plot, uh, uh, permanent, uh, the project of permanent plots in Croatia, it started like uh, 30 years ago and today we see the changes, so many changes on these plots uh, and we also, when we track the dates when the vegetation was uh, observed, when, when it was um, sampled, we can see the dates have also changed when we had some plants in flower or are we late, are we early to sample the vegetation. So today um, I would conclude this, that uh, the observations that we have with GLOBE uh, are very important and are used. I often, uh, I often go and uh, look at them. Unfortunately, still uh, I haven't managed to uh, publish some new research. However, I am uh, working on it with my colleagues and I believe that we will have really nice uh, visible conclusions on which we can act. And thank you for now. I hope I wasn't too long. Thank you very much, Zorana. So uh, this was the presentation, not just about research, but directly from the research. Uh, yes. Zorana talked to us um, in the middle of her field work day in her break. So thank you very much, Zorana, for finding time to be here with us. And uh, uh, it was if you a have privilege. And Does anybody have any questions, maybe, or to discuss anything, to comment, or...? You can write to chat, or you can also unmute your microphone and speak directly. Please feel free to ask. Okay, I, I have a question. Mm -hmm. Hi, Zorana. Uh, I, you, you talk about the future and about, you know, all the changes. So what is the situation in Croatia? Uh, are the scientists, uh, you know, included into some strategies, uh, for example, some political decisions, you know, that may actually impact um, uh, you know, the situation... To act, to do climate. something about... Yeah, yeah, if, if they are, you know, if there is some new law or some new measure which is prepared for your country, um, are the scientists part of that or is it just like politics and they don't really ask um, biologists, you know, for data or for preparing some scenarios or like that? Do you have any okay. experience with that? Uh, well, uh, some organization like uh, Climate Kick are entering uh, the, the the world world organization are entering Croatia for a couple of years now, and now new initiatives are starting. Where actually that organization, for example, started to uh, pioneers to practice to collect different approaches. Like we need engineers, we need botanists, we need meteorologists, we need people from different aspects to give innovative uh, solutions. But what I wanted to also um, uh, say that the, uh, Croatia has a rather new president 
and uh, for the first time he has a counselor that uh, is concerning uh, climate change and uh, energetics. So uh, it, it is a person who is uh, for a long time in energetics and uh, has uh, some experience in it and um, in climate uh, change also. So for the first time actually a politician uh, took an expert on climate change, on energetics, to cons to counsel him and to be able to act politically on these topics. So that that's something I think uh, is really uh, changed, and I hope uh, that uh, also uh, this old COVID situation uh, also made some politicians think, okay, people, now we really need to consider the scientists. Uh, we also had the strong earthquake, so uh, that's when the scientists were really appreciated to, <laughs> to have, the, have a go. Uh, but yeah, I think the, the, the atmosphere, political atmosphere, is really starting to change a bit. However, the po politics is always politics, let's be honest. <laughs> but uh, I believe that we will make progress in that uh, direction too. Thank you. It's good to know. <laughs> yeah, well, I, I hope so. And uh, I am also starting to be part of some groups that are working on it. And I hope we will make it, uh, we will make a good entrance and uh, have results at least uh, first on paper and afterwards uh, in real life because of course you have to first make the papers, make the rules, make the legislacy and then we, you can act. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, are there any more questions? There is still a chance to write them into the chat or please ask directly. Well, okay, uh, since I don't see any other questions or raised hands, um, thank you uh, once more, Zorana. And uh, so if I can ask Lenka Harikova to talk now about uh, the phenology research in Czech Republic. I just wanted to tell bye-bye and I have to go to the field. So I will have everyone have a good time and salute you and continue and uh, congratulations to every participant. Have a good day in the, in the field. Bye bye. Yeah, thank you. Bye bye. 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 Thanks bye. for joining. <laughs> so, uh, my name is Lenka Haikova. Can I start? Yes. Can you, yes. Can you hear me? Yeah. Yeah. Wow. And I am from the Czech Hydrometeorological Institute, and I am responsible for the phenology in this institute and uh, mostly in the Czech Republic. Uh, I can. The follow uh, Zorana that uh, the phenology in the Czech Republic uh, was in the wrong position in the last years. But nowadays it's uh, becoming more and more better because uh, everybody thinks that the phenology started to be more and more important and it can be used in many, many fields uh, of uh, human activities. So now I can. Uh, share the screen, yes. Okay, can you see it? Perfect. So, I was thinking what to put into my presentation to be, uh, to be nice for you, to be interesting for you. So, I decided, I'm sorry, I can't move the slides. Can we maybe, help? maybe wait a second? If yeah. sometimes it just sometimes techniques take <laughs> a little bit of time, yeah. and it's yeah. If it doesn't move anyway, it, it's uh, sometimes it's better with the uh, arrows to go to the sides, and sometimes it's better to use a mouse button. So try, try both options. I have no mouse. I have just this. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> Maybe here? Yeah, yeah, I found it. Ah, perfect. <laughs> perfect. <laughs> yeah. 
So I, I would like to tell you a few words about the uh, phonological observation in the Czech Republic, how is organized it, uh, and uh, what for we use data, the part of this usage, and I have many, many pictures in my presentation to show you impact of the drought on the vegetation in 2015. So the Czech Hydrometeorological Institute have a network of the phenological, phenological station. Uh, till 2012, we had a network of three types of uh, phenological stations. We had the field crops, uh, fruit trees and uh, white plants. But due to financial reduction, we have to stop the field and fruit stations. Now they found that it's a really pity because we need the information about the field and also about the fruit due to climate change and due to in this year in the Czech Republic we had three waves of uh, frost and uh, the information about the starting of blossoming of fruit trees was really, really important and we, we had no data so we had to use some models and it was really pity. So nowadays we have the just wild plants and uh, our volunteer observers use the methodology instruction and also they use the uh, phenological atlas. I can show it here, <laughs> yeah, if you can see it. Uh, uh, that uh, there are the pictures of the phenological phases and all the data are collected in our institute and after control we put it into the database uh, phenodata. Uh, so in the wild plants we have 45 species, uh, 24 trees and sh shrubs and uh, the others are herbs. And we also observed the uh, meadow, as, uh, as Zorana was talking about it. Uh, it's, this information is also really important for some field of human activity. We observe vegetative and generative phenophases. And uh, nowadays we have about 30 volunteer observers. Uh, when we establish a new phenological station, we we create a situation plan and we also put the metadata about the station into the in our database. The metadata is the like its altitude, orientation, lightning, moisture conditions and so on. And uh, the observers observe uh, individual species uh, from one species at least three or five individuals in a good health condition and they put the date of the of the uh, phenophase onset in the um, in the date but in the database uh, we use it as a day of a, of a year so so this is the an example of the situation plan. This is the station in, in Prague. So here you can see the, or, uh, the places where are some, uh, some species observed. And uh, this is an example of phenological station. Uh, if you want to imagine is it's not the station behind the fence, but it's a part of the landscape. Yeah, so uh, the, our observer go go outside and uh, always when we establish a new station we try to find as many species as much as uh, closer to to the observer's uh, home that he had no 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 so much time to to go around this uh, this uh, station and uh, it it's usually works and uh, I found uh, myself that uh, along or not along, very close to the to my home, I have so many species, and it's not so much time to to go and observe these species. And and this is the example of uh, phenophases. 
So here you can see sprouting of one bean. This is the beginning of flowering of elder. Uh, here is the inflorescence emergence of willow, and this is uh, flowering of hazel. So, uh, so we have about 30, so 30 stations. Nowadays, uh, before 2012, we had uh, more than 100 stations. So uh, I want to, to admire you or to, you know, that, that it's very important, the, the phenological observation from globe and from uh, other, uh, other types of phenological information, uh, because it's important to, uh, to have the density of the network as much as possible to make results from these observations. And uh, most of the stations in the Czech Republic are situated uh, between 200 to 600 meters above sea level. Uh, it's about uh, 25 stations and uh, we have uh, here one station, it's the highest station in the, in the Czech Republic, it's more than 1000 meters above sea level and uh, this, uh, this station and this station are in the lowlands, so it's the nearest, uh, in, in the nearest position. Uh, in the Czech Republic we have also the International Phenological Garden. Uh, we have three international phenological gardens in the Czech Republic. One is in the Doksane, and this uh, phenological garden is uh, usually behind the fence. Yes, you can see it here, or this is the plan. And uh, this, uh, these uh, plants are from the same, they have the same genetic, uh, genetic basis. Uh, all these plants are from one garden in Germany and this project uh, was, in, was established in 2057 in Germany. The first phenological garden was established in, two, uh, in, in 1959, I'm sorry, uh, 1959. And uh, uh, now, nowadays there are many, many phenological gardens uh, in the whole Europe and it's uh, really important for the for for making results from these observations because it's the it's the same uh, genetic basis uh, it's the it's the different uh, to our phenology in our institute yeah uh, and in the observation, there are 18 species. Some of them are the same as we have in our observation program, some of them different. For example, for Zetea or Syringa or Betula pubescens. And uh, here are observed seven phenological phases uh, uh, from such as beginning of leaf unfolding, beginning and end of flowering, first stripes roots and autumn coloring and leaf fall. And the data are put into the uh, database, uh, which is in uh, Berlin. Uh, Humboldt University is responsible for this database. And uh, the observers put the data, data online. And as I have the information from Lenka, that yesterday there was a webinar with uh, specialist for International Phenological Garden in, uh, from Switzerland. So maybe you can follow also this webinar and find new information, interesting information. Now, and now what, uh, what for we can use uh, this uh, phenological information. So uh, nowadays we mostly use it for the allergology. We put the online information on the Czech Hydrometeorological Institute website about uh, what is now flowering and it, uh, is it early or later. On the slide you can see the long-term uh, long uh, phenological calendar uh, which was cal calculated uh, from our stations from the period uh, 1991 till uh, 2015. 
and nowadays uh, we have uh, according the one one methodology a uh, certain years uh, time series uh, because the same methodology methodology for the white plants we have the, the since 1991 so we have the 30 years so uh, Average, so it's 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 very useful for some decisions or for for some results and papers and so on. So so this is the um, uh, exam and uh, this is an example what uh, what you can find on our website. So it's the beginning of flowering of uh, uh, Penosilvestris. Uh, so it's the, the time this year in the Czech Republic. And, and on other map, you can see the difference uh, from the long-term average. So uh, that's the number of days, how earlier uh, the, uh, the spruce beca became a flower earlier. And uh, mainly on the whole, on the whole country, it was it was earlier. The earliest uh, dates were uh, more than eight days earlier than it's usual. Uh, 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 of course, we use the phenological data in the climate change research. Uh, uh, because the phenology in the Czech Republic has a long, long history. We have many, many results since 1923 and uh, mostly since uh, 1940s. But uh, it's a problem that uh, most of the data are just on the, in, in a paper. So we have to digitalize them and uh, use them for our results. But uh, it it goes on, and we we get more and more more data in the in our database. So here in this example, you can see the the change in the beginning of flowering of silver birch, uh, and uh, it's uh, the trend is. Uh, oh, one one point day per decade. Now and uh, here you can see the results in the in the map. So we compare the beginning of flowering of uh, Sorbus occuparia. So this is the period 1931 till 1960, and uh, follow the colors in the map. You will see the changes. Uh, yeah, you you can see the more more and more red color. So it's the uh, earlier, and this is the map in the 1991-2011. So as uh, as Zorana said, that we we see that the the final phases uh, starting earlier, mainly the spring phases. On the other side, the autumn phases. Uh, becomes becomes later, and uh, we use the, this data also for the pest control and for the for the forecast. Uh, in the as I said, for the for the warnings uh, before with, before frost and others. And uh, at the third part of my presentation, I prepared some pictures about the impact of drought on vegetation in 2015. Uh, Czech Republic uh, has uh, more and more difficulties with droughts. It has started in 2015 and uh, nearly every year is, uh, is there is a drought uh, this year, or, or of course, again, and it's not, it's not very pleasant and it's, it's uh, uh, only one good point uh, from this point of view is that the politicians have to have to listen to 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 scientists and to also follow the results uh, and to make the decisions. I think that the situation is also a little bit similar as Solana was talking about the changing in the politician decisions. So here you can see the European beach uh, in, uh, that was uh, very dry in this year, but uh, next year it was uh, uh, okay. Uh, and this is the 
uh, on, on leaves. Yeah, you can see the necrosis on leaves of the, on, the, on the oak. Yeah, yeah, there is the, also there is a maple. Uh, that the fruits uh, uh, became became dry, yeah. and uh, this uh, this peak of this drought in 2015 was in the second half of the August, and at the at the end of August at the and beginning of the September came uh, some precipitation and uh, now I show you pictures how the vegetation started to change after this uh, a little bit rain. Yeah, so here you can see on Sambucus nigra that uh, you, you, here is the fruit and uh, here are new new leaves as it was in the spring and uh, here you can see the flowers and the fruits together. So it was really interesting to, to go to the nature after this uh, uh, after this rain, rain rainfall and to uh, follow the the nature and make the pictures and uh, follow how the nature is changing. Yes, and here on the uh, lime tree you can see the the new leaves. So it was like like in a in a in a spring, and new new flowers on the on the oak, and also as a new new leaf. So it's that's all. If you have any questions, uh, I can uh, I can uh, reply if I be able and. Thank you for your attention and please follow the phenology and help us to have more and more results and to do more and more conclusions. Thank you. Thank you very much, Lenka. It was, it was uh, very interesting for me to see how uh, trees can really react to, to the unpleasant or difficult conditions, such things like uh, new leaves in autumn can happen. So thank you for showing to us and also talking about the network. And yes, if, if there are any questions, please um, un unmute your microphones and ask or write to the chat. Uh, Lenka, I'm Viera from Slovakia and I would like to ask you how often do you make the observations at, at the phenological stations? How often they go to the to the field? Yes, how often yes. they go to the field? Uh, in the vegetation season, uh, mainly in spring, they go every two three days mm -hmm. uh, because the changes are so fast. So if they want if they uh, f want to follow the the real time of the phenological phase, they had to go they had to go so, such often. Then later they can go once once a, a week, yes. Mm -hmm. But in the spring, it's really important. Mm -hmm. and, yeah. and I am in a close contact with my observers, and it's it's a, it's, it's a very good cooperation. Yes. Mm -hmm. Is there something similar happening in Slovakia? The same research as you do? Do, yes, do you know, I know. something about that? <laughs> Yeah, I know, I know. The, I, I know that the Slovak Hydrometrics Institute have also the network and uh, uh, more more density they have. Mm -hmm. they, 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 they have also the field and fruit and also the wild plants. They have more stations because they they didn't make the reduction in mm -hmm. in these years. So I if if you want I I know some people from this slow institute so I can give you some contacts if you want to you know, you, you you can write me per email Okay thank you Thank you
I, I would also like to ask one question, if no one else does now. Uh, like you mentioned that uh, the number of observed species decreased, that, that uh, there used to be more, uh, more species observed and it is a pity that uh, we don't, uh, or the, the research on, on those species does not continue. Do you think uh, it will change? Is there some plan that more and more plants would be observed now? As, you know, <laughs> the climate change is, is important topic and the drought is important topic. And uh, well, last last year we made the uh, to the ministry we we made a proposal for the ministry that we want to uh, 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 have, have bigger network. Yes, we have more more species. Uh, we we spent a lot of time, but uh, they said no <laughs> because they have no money. But uh, we are in a close contact with the. Uh, with the website uh, www.fenofaz.cz and they, on this website they collect some data also from the field and fruit. From the fruit it's mainly wine and from, from field there are five or six field, field crops. But maybe it will be changing, we will see. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. So, a bit more time for questions, if there are any. Okay, I will check uh, chat if there is something written once more, but I don't see anything. Well, um, then I think there is time for the presentation of Zuzka Lhotákova. Zuzka, can we ask you? Okay, I'm ready. So, good afternoon to everyone. My name is Zuzana Hotakova and I'm from Charles University in Prague. And myself, I'm a biologist and plant physiologist. And I thank very much to my two colleagues, to Zorana and Lenka, who made really great introduction for presentation of uh, pieces of my research. First, I would like to connect with Zorana, the, like she mentioned that phenology wasn't uh, much uh, um, considered even by the biologists. So that's my case as well, as I'm interested in forest health. Normally, 10 years ago, we went to the field once a year when the leaves are mature and ready and we made analysis, chemical analysis, and we made our conclusions. However, the time has changed, and since uh, three or four years ago, we are as well interested in changes in uh, several leaf uh, traits or characteristics during the year, or uh, at least more than once a year. So for us, plant physiologists, the phenology became more important as well. Now with changing climate and changing environment. Uh, and uh, then, uh, well, so now I think that I will start uh, to share my screen. And uh, like uh, Lenka Kleger uh, last webinar, uh, introduced you something about the carbon cycle. So I'm the one who wrote the carbon cycle newsletter. So I would like to connect some uh, aspects of phenology with the carbon cycle because phenology is easy to follow. You can see that the bud bursts, that the leaves grow, that the leaves change color and that they fall. However, you can see anything directly about the carbon. So I will try to connect those things as well. And then the important thing is as well, Zorana mentioned that for phenology, you need to have data from more season. Uh, but we started recently, so I don't have any nice conclusions yet. However, 
I will show you something from the scientist kitchen, how we work, uh, how we deal with the samples, and maybe I have some suggestion how you can track the carbon stored in the leaves during the year. So let's start sharing the presentation. Uh, yeah. So first, I would like to say that all that I will show is a teamwork, that you, we are not only one scientist or two scientists working, but we are supported by the students and as well by other people who help us to achieve our measurements that we can do, uh, we can't do ourselves. For example, here the first person from the left is a tree climber who helps us to get the samples of the leaves from, from the canopies that could be 20 or 30 meters above our heads, so we cannot reach for the samples. And here it's written a lot of text. However, it's kind of summary of my ideas of connection carbon cycle and phenology and um, tree health or tree condition. So it's good to know that not only trees, but all plants use the carbon dioxide from the air to build their body, their leaves, stems and roots. So in fact, if you are observing like the leaves are growing and expanding and getting, uh, getting uh, greater and greener, in fact, you are observing carbon cycle because the leaf mass it's 50% carbon and the green color, it's chlorophyll, the leaf pigment that helps to capture the light and convert it to, uh, and convert energy to store the carbon. Then the second point is connected with the changing climate because trees and plants need so-called optimal uh, light, temperature and water availability availability to uh, grow uh, and perform photosynthesis. So it means they need light enough, but not too much. They, they need temperature, not too low, not too high. They need good amount of water. The third idea is that trees take up car carbon dioxide from the air by the green leaves and lock the carbon in their body so they can do it. Uh, uptake the carbon only if they have the leaves nice, green and healthy. So they don't do it during the winter and they start to do it in the spring after the, they have the green leaves. Uh, the fourth idea is that, well, it's kind of scientific um, wording that we can trace the seasonal course of carbon fluxes. That means well, we can graphically see or measure when the carbon dioxide goes from the atmosphere to the trees or vice versa, other way from the trees to the atmosphere because they breathe as well. Uh, and uh, the fifth idea, maybe I mentioned that as well before, that only green and healthy leaves can take up carbon and make the plant perform well. So we have some methods how we can measure the tree health. For, for example, the green, green leaves could be one uh, sign of healthy, healthy tree. And um, well, even though we are, or you are focused on trees in the phenological campaign, Zorana uh, also mentioned some other uh, plants um, followed by the phenological observation and Lenka as well mentioned the uh, crops. Uh, so I will show you that not only trees but as well grasses store the carbon in their leaves uh, and accumulate it during the season from the spring to the autumn. And then we can ask the questions 
how the trees, grasses and other plants, uh, how their health and carbon storage may change with the changing climate. But I will stop with this question because I don't have the uh, answer yet. So I will show you three um, case studies or places, permanent plots where we do our research and comment on some methods, how we measure some parameters on leaves that we can use to track changing uh, characteristics of leaves during the season. So first is uh, Southern Moravia on the border with Austria and Slovakia. It's flat plain forest, uh, which is really um, forest with high biodiversity, many species of trees. Then the second one, the second case uh, is uh, example from Beskidi Mountains, that's North Moravia. And here I only use the example of some trees, European beech and Norway maple, and show you what happened inside the leaf from the spring to the autumn and how the leaf get thicker and, and, and greener. And then the second uh, or third example is about the grasses from Krkonoshe mountains. So let's go to the floodplain forest. So, well, we have a question. How much carbon travels from the atmosphere to the floodplain forest and from the forest to the atmosphere? Uh, I don't have the answer yet because we need to have information from more seasons to get the um, really robust conclusion. However, I will show you a little bit how we can do it. The first measurement is the measurement of carbon dioxide flux. And the second is, uh, well, and this first one, it's made by um, the devices, the machines. And the second one, the measuring of tree health or leaf characteristics in the field, it's done by us, by the scientists and students. And we do it in the field, like Zorana today, in the laboratory, then we flow with chemical analysis. And as well, uh, because we are only small teams, so we can't be everywhere. And we want to have information from the bigger area. So we can use sensors mounted in the airplanes to get information from the big, bigger area of the flat plain forest or of whatever forest. So this is our first plot. You can see the canopy of the floodplain forest from above. Uh, and below in, in, in the slide, you can see how it looks like in, in the spring, uh, maybe now in May, and then how it looks like in the winter. So first, let's just comment a little bit how we can measure how much carbon dioxide goes to the trees and how much goes out of the forest. So in the middle of uh, that forest, there's an experimental site and there's a tower. You can see the tower from below on the left, uh, left image. The tower is 40 meters high. So it means that uh, it's end, uh, about 10 meters above the canopy above all the trees and on the top of the tower you can find several devices that are able to measure concentration of carbon dioxide and as well they measure wind speed and wind direction. So uh, by this device you have information about carbon dioxide concentration and the direction of its of it flux, but it goes from the atmosphere uh, to the canopy or other way. Uh, and then the data are recorded on hour or minute basis and uh, done every, every day, so you have information for all the season. However, we need information as well from the trees. So we are not able to do the measurements every minute, hour, or even every day. So, well, uh, last year we went to the floodplain forest four, four times in the year. 
and we collected samples of leaves from from the trees to get information about its chemical composition and uh, about its weight to know how the leaves expand and how they get thicker and heavier so that means how they build their biomass and use carbon so in the lower image you can see the field laboratory how we uh, get some of our devices and machines from the lab and we make some kind of picnic site but uh, we don't have here cakes and lemonade and beer we have uh, computers and uh, small wild scissors and working working with leaves and um, well on the right side you can see well if we won't have if we won't have information uh, from the tree we can't just collect one leaf from above or from from the canopy we need some sample and the good sample is from the above the canopy where it's enough light so uh, we collaborate with the tree climber who climbs our our selected trees and goes up to the canopy and brings us the leaves for analysis and now i would like to comment a little bit how to do that uh well usually or in past times there were used so-called um, uh, arboristic climbing irons and they are uh, you you can see them on the upper left side and you put them on on your feet and then you can climb the tree however you can see the spike the sharp iron thing that you use to climb the tree but you harm the tree and we 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 don't want to do that we want we won't have information about uh, about healthy tree so uh, we collaborate with such a people who use other equipment uh, that's uh, some special equipment made from ropes that uh, he can safely climb the 40 40 meter or 30 meter high tree without harming harming it so it's one one thing that maybe if if you are doing your phenological campaign you can consider uh, whether whether your trees and and samples then survive and the other thing is i commented that we would like to get results for the uh, bigger area but we can't sample in every tree in a forest. So we use special cameras mounted in the airplane and we can get information from, from above. So here, what you see is the part of the pl flat plane forest uh, photographed uh, from, the, uh, from the airplane. And you can do it even from the satellite. And well, on the right side of my slide, you can see, well, a lot of uh, colorful curves. But the important things on the left, you have spring. In the middle, you have summer on the uh, X axis. And on the right, you have autumn. And uh, the numbers 18, 145 and so on, it means day of the year. It mentioned Lenka as well, how they number the days in a year uh, through the phenological campaign. And uh, you can see that all the curves that tell us something about the tree behavior or all forests, the canopy behavior, they follow more or less the same pattern. They start somewhere low in the spring, then they climb the hill, peak in the summer, and then in the autumn they they go down so uh, and those parameters that we can calculate from the airborne or data from the satellite it could be canopy greenness or leaf cover or even carbon storage so then we can have this information for each pixel or some part of of the image so that's the idea how to get information from the bigger part however uh, i don't have the answer yet 
and because we have to record more seasons because like uh, Lenka and Zorana mentioned that there are many factors interacting like uh, temperature, solar radiation, weather, water availability and the length of veg vegetation season. That means uh, what my colleagues mentioned, uh, the first day when or the day when the uh, leaves expand and the day when the leaves uh, fall down. Uh, well, so I showed you how to take samples from the trees, how we can get information from some airborne images. And now we can a little bit have a look uh, on the leaves. What uh, analysis uh, do we do with them? I mentioned the idea or, or the fact that the trees must have green and healthy leaves containing chlorophyll pigment to perform photosynthesis and store carbon. So we can measure during the year how the leaves get greener accumulating chlorophyll and get thicker accumulating carbon and then how they lose weight uh, losing water and recycling nutrients and storing them in the stem during the autumn uh, well and we have two approaches that we use one is uh, so called uh, well following leaf internal structure the cellular structure using leaf cross sections you can see how it looks like on the uh, left lower lower left side of the slide and as well we can characterize the leaf greenness by chemical analysis of the chlorophyll content or there are uh, available some um, pocket devices that measure chlorophyll content as well based on how much light goes through the leaf so now we can see some results. So I have here the example of European beech and Norway maple and the blue stripes or windows uh, on the slide. Those are the leaf cross sections. So you can see that uh, all the time the leaf has some um, so-called epidermis it's like a skin that covers the leaf and inside those are the cells that uh, normally are green and contain chlorophyll and perform photosynthesis. Now they are um, stored and stained so the, the, the blue is not true color. And you can see on the images that from the April through May, July, September, the leaves get thicker and then to the end of the season, there may be a, a little bit of the thickness reduction due to losing water and recycling some parts or nutrients from the leaf. So, well, it takes a lot of work to, uh, to, make, to make the leaf sections. However, uh, you can measure the, how the leaf gets thicker even by the other simple method. So, scientists use the parameter leaf mass per area you can imagine that it's a weight of one meter squared of leaves imagine big leaf of square meter and you put it on the scale or you can harvest a lot of leaves of of the uh, one square meter and put it to the scale or you can just harvest one leaf measure the area put it on the scale and see the ratio of the weight to the, uh, to the area. It's really simple to do it. You need just a scanner or you can draw, draw the leaf and then you need a scale and, and weigh the leaf when it's dry. And then we did this uh, collection and this simple analysis uh, four times a year. And you can, you can see on those boxes that the first left graph shows like the this leaf mass per area goes up since uh, April to September. Like leaves, uh, leaves expand, grow, get thicker, heavier, and store some carbon. And then 
uh, from the September to October, they prepare to uh, fall off and some material is uh, recycled, water is uh, um, recycled or evaporated and the leaves prepare to go off. So this uh, leaf mass per area goes down. And the same, very same pattern follows as well the leaf greenness, the content of chlorophyll pigments. You can see as well that it goes up since the April to July, September, and then like uh, leaves get yellow. Uh, that means that this particular uh, pigment is decayed and then the tree uh, doesn't any anymore have the ability to convert the light energy to fix the carbon. So maybe measuring the leaf mass per area could be some activity to the phenological campaign that you n uh, not only observe the leaves and take the photos, but you weigh them and you have the information about carbon stored in the leaves during the season. And well, I think I'm being too long, so I just uh, say that it's not only trees uh, who fix the carbon, all the plants do it. And there are some landscapes or countries where you We can hear now. So carbon. Okay. And uh, this is the example. Can you hear me, Lenka? Is it okay? Yes, it's better now. Yeah, yeah. There was some. Yeah, yeah. Uh, some time without sound. Mountains uh, and it's grasslands. Uh, and uh, well, uh, we have uh, research focused on uh, changing the species composition because they are, there is uh, one species which is original here. However, there are other species that are, that they are um, <laughs> well, like making invasion and uh, taking the space. Uh, so our main interest is in the speed of uh, changing the species composition, but as well in the grass uh, physiological condition and um, ability to store carbon. So, uh, well, you can see here the plot and uh, some patches of the invading grasses uh, here in, in the lower side and we use not only Mm, field collections, but as well, we try to get some airborne pictures from drones, uh, but it's not so easy like it looks like. However, uh, the graph in the lower left corner shows you the same as for the trees, that parameter, leaf mass per area, how the uh, leaf is uh, thick or heavy per square meter uh, from uh, June, July and August. So we have only part of the vegetation season. So we only see the rise of um, this parameter and carbon stored in the leaves. However, if we get more to the field and do other sampling, then we, we would see the fall as well as in the trees. So uh, well, now I think that I got to the end to show you some small pieces from the scientist kitchen that we need to really know more about the carbon cycling in changing the environment. However, uh, we are not read yet ready with our results. And well, if you have any questions, you are welcome and you can think uh, about including maybe measurement leaf mass per area to your phenological campaign to get some idea how the carbon stored in the leaf changes during the season. Thank you very much. Um, I'm waiting for your questions and have a nice afternoon.
Thank you very much, Zuzka. Uh, thank you for um, showing us your research and for uh, talking also about the connection of phenology and carbon cycle. It's, it's very interesting to, to hear. And I, I want to add that <laughs> in the last regional, global regional meeting, there was also a course of uh, climbing the trees, this harmless climbing of trees. And uh, as Zuzka showed the pictures, it might look quite easy, but it's not. <laughs> so it's, a, it's a, another difficult discipline connected to carbon cycle research. Okay. There is, and there is yes, a question please. in the in the chat. Uh, well, what is the instrument which measures the chlorophyll? Well, there are several. I can, if if you give me the contact, I can uh, send the tips. How, however, they are quite expensive. There, there's one that's produced with some small company from US. It's called uh, Multispec. Uh, and it's the mo most cheap for 1,000 US dollars. And the others are even more expensive. So, uh, and they work on, on the principle that the device had a um, LED, LED light, uh, usually red light, that shines on the leaf in a leaf clip and then the sensor on the other side of the leaf, below the leaf measures how much the red light comes through because uh, chlorophyll is absorbing primarily blue and red light so more chlorophyll less red light goes through so well i can i can send the links for all for some chlorophyll matters we use however I just warned that they are not uh, very cheap. Zuzka, thank you for the presentation. I have a question. How, mm -hmm. would, you, how would you explain to a small kid your... Um, um, the one of the statement that you had on the, I think, first or second slide, it was number three, that um, uh, the tree starts to build in the carbon only when the tree has a green leaves, right? Yeah. Yeah. And, but in the, let's say in February, some trees, they don't have any leaves. So where they will get the energy if they cannot if they don't uh, store the carbon. So how can the leaves even s start to, to grow? You know, if the, it's like yeah. a puzzle. It's yeah. like, like yeah. a quiz, right? Because you say that they cannot grow if they don't do photosynthesis, but if they, they don't have any, they cannot do photosynthesis, but they grow anyway. So how you would explain yeah. it? To that, that, that's really tricky. How to get carbon in the spring if you have no green leaves? Well, compare it to yourself. You need some food for being alive, to move, to run. But are you eating all the time? No, you just get a snack. Get, uh, make some uh, storage or, and then you use the energy. The tree does it the same. During the spring or during the summer, when it has leaves, it takes up carbon and in the autumn he took a lot of carbon and store it in the trunk and in the, in the roots and makes like you put a f uh, food in the, uh, in the fridge. You store it for later and then it goes to sleep during the winter. Then when the springs come up and the temperatures are better and sun is shining then uh, the tree opens its so-called fridge in the trunk and in the roots and takes up all the supplies, the carbon stored here, and build up a small green leaf. And the small green leaf starts photosynthesis, start work, start eat more carbon and make, uh, make itself uh, larger. And then 
it stores all the carbon in the trunk and in the, in the roots again for the next year. So what the, kids, <laughs> what, yeah. what the kids says. Yes, perfect. I think the analogy with the fridge that sometimes is closed, but if you need, you can open it if you are hungry. That's perfect. Yeah. Yeah, but the, with the changing climate, it may be the problem that if the winter and the trees is sleeping and keeps the fridge closed is too short, then the long time supplies can dry out and you don't have any reserves. That yeah. can be a problem. So you then once you open the fridge and it's empty, it's right? Empty. So, and then you have problem. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. Are there any more questions? You can write or talk. Can I? Zuska, can you hear me? Yeah, it was really interesting and it's a very interesting research and uh, that you can also use the airplane and uh, use so many methods. Yeah. It's, it's very nice work, yes. Thank you for the explanation, yeah. Thank you. It's always necessary not to only use one method because every method have it has its uh, pitfalls or it doesn't tell you everything. So the best way is to use a combination because then your um, conclusions are better. <laughs> yes, yes. Uh, thank you. It was very nice. <laughs> We still have a bit more time for questions. Someone wants to talk. Well, I don't see any raised hands or questions in the chat. So if no one wants to ask, I want to ask you all actually. So I have uh, two more questions. And uh, I will share my screen again. So I, I would like to ask you, what are three words that you will remember from this webinar? And uh, you can either go to this menti.com and use the code, type the code uh, 935715. Or you can also look to the chat window and there is a link. If you click on the link, you can, uh, you will get directly to the, to the question and you will be able to reply. And uh, this is one of the questions, but there is one more after that. You will see it right away. So what are the three words uh, that you will remember from this webinar? And uh, what topic would be interesting for you to hear at the next webinar? So we would like to, you know, plan more activities that are interesting, that are beneficial for you. So it's very helpful for us to know what, what you would actually be interested in. So this is a good opportunity to tell us. And we can try to bring you more information. So please, you can you can uh, vote on menti.com with the code ninety three fifty seven fifteen. I hope it works for you. We should soon see some replies, maybe. Okay, we can already. If you if you wrote down your question, submitted your question, you can come back to Zoom again, and uh, you will see we are already getting some some replies. So you will see what are the main words that will stay in our minds after leaving today. Uh, 
And we'll see if there are any bits. Okay. Let's give it a few more seconds. It's the number of words is increasing and we are having nice and colorful and interesting word cloud. Well, so I can see the phenological garden was an was important topic today, as well as carbon cycle. And then of course, words related to um, phenology directly, phenologist, but chlorophyll meter also will stay in our minds. And I see something in the in the chat window. So I'll try to look. Whether there are any questions. Okay. So, yeah, I will check once more the topics. Yeah, there are some. Okay, so carbon cycle and a phenological garden will definitely stay in our minds for a long time. And the no hurting tree climbing was interesting, as I can see. The phenology, carbon cycle, the climate change topic is important from this as well. And let's let's see the topics. So it's dealing dealing with aligned species. Thank you for the suggestion. And uh, differences in the health of trees in cities, rural areas or other different environments. Okay, that's, that's actually a very interesting topic. Uh, we will think how to, how to approach it. And the last suggestion is how trees and plants react on dry seasons and what happens in their bodies. Are they stressed? Okay, so thank you very much. I will stop sharing. Thank you very much for the suggestions. Um, if, if there is something that uh, some of our scientists would like to very quickly mention in the end regarding these topics, is there something like that? Well, I know that. I, yeah. I can comment, but uh, show me the questions again or the topics. I will. I will. Just a second. Well, the first one was how to deal with alliance, dealing with alliance species. Uh, well, it's not a topic that I solve myself, but I know a group of colleagues from the Botanical Institute in Czech Republic and they use the small airplanes to monitor the alliance species as well. Uh, so that's the first step to know where they are and how they spread and to be able to uh, recognize them on the bigger areas from the uh, original or non-alliance species. However, I think that the more important stage, how to get rid of them or to, well, not give them the space, it's the other and not, not yet resolved. The second topic was difference in health of trees in cities and rural areas and other different environments. Well, only short comment. I have a student who is particularly interested in this topic. She just starts her experimental work, so we don't have the design yet. However, uh, this is the topic that it's really researched. And um, well, one example, rising temperature in, in cities, cities creating so-called um, heat islands. It could lead uh, to some conditions that they increase the tree growth. So it can look like that the trees and the cities get 
uh, or are living better. But there are a lot of other factors that uh, make their life really harsh, which is compacted soil, uh, lack of space, air pollution, and the high temperature could be the problem as well. So I think it's really important topic and I don't know whether I can give the seminar myself, but well, we will see. And the third one, how trees and plants react on dry seasons and what happens in their bodies. Are they stressed? Uh, yes, they are. And um, well, um, there's a part of the plant science, we, we call it stress physiology. So like in the human body, you can uh, observe changes in some hormones or compounds that you have in your blood when you are stressed. You can see some compounds that plant uh, produce in their body when they are stressed. For example, some of them, they can help the plant to survive. Uh, it could be uh, maybe some special sugars or um, maybe proteins uh, that help the plant to face the drought, to keep the water in its body even though the water is scarce. So yes, the plants as well face stress and you can see it in the metabolites or in the chemical compounds they have in their body. So just shortly I answered the topics. Thank you, Zuzka, very much for your comments. So I will stop sharing now. Yes, and these are definitely interesting topics, and we will um, consider how to how to plan a webinar that would be uh, related to it, and and uh, tell you even more about the topics and and more of what Zuzka just now uh, showed us or. Uh, introduced us to. Okay, so I think it's that's it for today. Um, it may be if there's someone really last question or comment before I finish. No, I think not. So thank you very much for being here with us today. Thank you for joining our webinar and uh, many thanks to Lenka, Zuska and to Zorana for presenting and sharing their research with us and yeah have a good day and i hope to see you soon at some uh, further webinar thank you thank you goodbye 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 have a nice afternoon and check your phenological garden <laughs>